Hello, I'm Laura Bennett with German with Laura, and this is my fifth video in a 10 part series on how to learn German smarter, not harder. In this video, we are going to talk about the dreaded German case system that causes wailing and gnashing of teeth. If you haven't watched the previous videos in this series, you can catch up on them later. For now, let's tackle this topic together. So the German case system is complicated. It is confusing. It involves a lot of terminology that causes our eyes to glaze over. The names of the cases themselves, nominative, accusative, dative, genitive, then you have to understand what are these cases, how do you use them, when do you use them, what does this have to do with subject nouns, direct object nouns, indirect object nouns, yikes. So the bad news is this is hard. And secondly, you have to learn it because you will never be proficient, much less fluent in German, if you don't know how to use the case system properly. The good news is I'm going to show you step by step how the case system works so that you can nail it. It is totally possible. Hang in there with me and keep in mind that I have a special course created for you free. It's called English Grammar for German Learners. You can click below in the description to open up a new tab with that link so that you can sign up for that free course when you're done watching this video. I go into even greater depth in that free course. But for now, I'm going to give you my best synopsis of the German case system. And in order to do this, I firstly want you to understand why the German case system is so important, why you have to learn it. And to do that, we're going to start by first looking at English because you can leverage this amazing advantage of having a solid linguistic framework in your head already. You know on a subconscious level how English works, right? The patterns and the principles that underlie the functioning of English. And if we can bring that to the forefront of your consciousness, you will then be able to compare and contrast it with the German system and it will make much, much more sense. So let's look at this English sentence together. The woman sings her little baby a song. The first thing I want you to do is identify the nouns in this sentence, the people, places, things, and ideas. Okay, we have three. We have woman, baby, and song. Okay, so now I'm going to put these three nouns into three different slots. That's what I call them. And I'm going to color code them, which I'm going to explain in a moment. Okay, so firstly, I'm going to change to the next slide where we have that same sentence and then two variations on that sentence. So it's still all the same nouns, okay? And now I'm going to put them into these colored slots, color-coded slots, okay? So the woman in the first sentence goes into a pink slot. Then her baby is going to be in an orange slot, and a song is going to be in a yellow slot, okay? So now the thing that I want you to notice, I'm going to explain this, this is very important, is that every sentence has the same pattern of the pink slot comes first, the orange slot comes next, and the yellow slot comes last. So what is inside the slot changes in English, but the colors have to stay in this particular order. English has very rigid word order, and this is very important because it is the complete opposite of German. So in sentence number one, the woman sings her little baby a song. Great. This sentence makes sense. Sentence number two, when we flip things around, right, her little baby sings the woman a song. This still makes sense, but what we're saying is something different. We've moved these chunks of nouns and the words in front of them. We've shifted them around, and now we're saying something different in English. And now in the third sentence, worst of all, a song sings the woman her little baby, this rearranging doesn't even make sense, okay? So now with all of this in mind, contrast this with the exact same sentence in German. We have die Frau still pink 
singt ihrem kleinen Baby, still orange, ein Lied, still yellow. Okay, but now when I rearrange these slots, these chunks of words, the nouns plus the words coming directly in front of them that have to belong together with them, when I rearrange them in German, the order of our slots changes, okay? It stayed the same in English and the contents changed, but now in German, the slots themselves move around, okay? So die Frau is now over here in sentence number two, okay? And in number three, and ihrem kleinen Baby now is at the beginning. In sentence number three, it's at the end. Ein Lied, right, the song, here at the end, now it's at the beginning, okay? So this is a very, very important difference. And what I want you to know about this is that these three German sentences not only make sense, but they all mean the exact same thing, okay? So we saw with the English versions that they either changed their meaning or else they became completely nonsensical, right? And we also saw that the color coding stayed in the exact same pattern, pink, then orange, then yellow. In German, in contrast, the colors can switch around. What's staying in them stays the same. Pink is always the woman. Orange is always her little baby. A song is always yellow. But those things, those elements move around in the sentence. German has a flexibility here that English does not have. And why German is flexible is the case system. I'll get into the details of that in a moment, but for right now, let's dig into English a little more deeply and go back to our original sentence, okay? And the woman sings her little baby a song, okay? This uses what is called the nominative case and the objective case, although you've probably never heard these terms before because as far as English is concerned, this is pretty unimportant. But if we're being technical about it, we could say that the woman is in the nominative case because she is the subject of the sentence. She's the one taking action. The subject noun always goes into the nominative case in English or German or whatever language, okay? And in a standard sentence, it's going to come first, right? We saw with the English examples, it's always coming first, okay? Then next comes the verb, the action that the subject noun is taking, okay? And then in English, our two remaining nouns, baby and song, would just be called object nouns. Object nouns are simply non-subject nouns. Whatever is not the subject of the sentence is automatically an object noun. That's how simple it is in English. So technically then, her little baby is in the objective case, and so is a song, okay? And that's how simple this is in English. In English, it's all about the actual order of the words and the, the cases not so important. In German, though, the cases are vital and we have more of them. The objective case is going to split into two cases called the accusative case and the dative case. Let's check it out. Die Frau singt ihrem kleinen Baby ein Lied. Okay, so in this version of our sentence, we have the subject noun still coming first in the nominative case, right? The subject noun always goes into the nominative case, the verb still coming next. Then we have still the same two nouns, baby and song, but ihrem kleinen baby needs to be in the dative case because it's an indirect object noun, and ein Lied needs to go into the accusative case because it is a direct object noun. So now this begs the question, how on earth did I know which noun was the direct object and which noun was the indirect object? The subject noun, that's fairly straightforward, right? Whatever is taking action in the sentence and in a standard sentence, it's always going to come first. But with any of the remaining nouns in the sentence, how do you know when to use the accusative case and when to use the data? Okay, so we're going to break this down by looking at the same sentence in English and German simultaneously, one step at a time. Here we go. 
So in English and in German both, the most basic, the simplest sentence possible is going to contain just two elements. The subject noun, which goes into the nominative case, and then the action that that subject is taking, the verb, okay? So we have, for instance, the woman, that's the subject of the sentence, so it goes into the nominative case, that's the case used specifically and only for the subject noun, and then boom. The action that she's taking. Okay, so this is this is one sentence pattern that applies to both German and English. And the thing to notice here is that in a standard sentence in either English or in German, the subject noun, aka the nominative case, is going to come first in the sentence and then be followed by the verb. Okay, so now what if we want to add some additional information? What if we want to say what she's singing? Okay, now we can say the woman sings a song. This is now a second pattern where we've added in another case because we've added in another noun and every noun in German has to go into a case. So I'm gonna continue analyzing the English sentence here but through a German lens, okay? So now a song is going to go into the accusative case because the role it's playing in this sentence is that it is the direct object. The direct object is being directly acted upon by the subject. The subject is singing what? She's singing a song. The song is being sung by the woman. It's being directly acted upon. It is passive while the subject is active in this sentence, okay? So now what happens if we want to add more information yet? Okay, if we want to add in that additional element of her little baby, right, we're adding in who the song is being sung to or who is being impacted by the song, who is being given the song, if you will, okay, that is going to go into the dative case because it is the indirect object. And here arrows can really help us out. So if we have the woman, the subject noun in the nominative case, connected to the verb, connected to the action that she's taking, then we go directly from that verb to the song that is being acted upon, okay? And from the song, we move backwards to the dative case, to this indirect object that gets inserted in between the nominative and the accusative cases. So the reason why we have this language of direct object and indirect object is because of how it works with these arrows, right? The subject noun, the woman, goes directly through the verb to the song, but it only gets to her little baby indirectly from the song. And, or in other words, a different way to look at it would be that we couldn't just have the nominative case, the verb, and then the dative case. We couldn't say the woman sings her little baby. Mm, that doesn't make sense. We're missing something there. We've skipped over the direct object, which we're not allowed to do in this kind of sentence setup, okay? So we have the first pattern, now I'm going to analyze the German one, so we'll do this again, essentially. Okay, so first sentence, we can have simply the woman sings and then stop, right? That is a sentence unto itself. That's our first pattern. Or we can move on to the next pattern by adding in the accusative case, right? So then the principle here is that after your subject noun is taken care of, after that nominative case is identified, which I will repeat in a standard English and German sentence will be the first noun in the sentence, then the second noun that can be added and have the sentence still make sense is going to be a direct object in the accusative case. This as a default, of course, we're speaking about general principles here. So then after you have a direct object added to the sentence, if you add more information yet, right, it is going to be who is being impacted. And that is the indirect object, which we have to put in the dative case. So I know that this is 
complicated still. You've probably not worked with this kind of vocab in a long time, or if you did at any point, it probably wasn't a positive experience. And you need to keep in mind that this requires more practice. I know this, and this is exactly why I created my free English Grammar for German Learners course, which again, you can click down below in the description to open up a new tab with that link so you can register for that free course and practice, practice, practice more sentences such as these where you're identifying where is the subject noun, where is the direct object, where is the indirect object, right? And, and practice using these three different cases, the nominative, the accusative, and the data. So all of this has been information on what the cases are and when you need to use them based on the role that the noun is playing in the sentence and these particular orders, right? But how does this relate to the German sentences that we looked at at the very beginning where we looked at the woman sings her baby a song, but also the scrambled versions? So let's check that out one more time. So again, in German, we have die Frau, the woman, that is always remaining the subject of the sentence, even when it moves to different spots in the sentence, a different order. And the song is always the direct object, always in the accusative case, even though its position in the sentence is changing. And her little baby, is always the indirect object in the dative case, even when its position in the sentence changes. So what is it that allows us to mix around the cases here without changing the meaning of our sentence? That is, ta -ta -ta -ta, what are called declensions. And they are these slightly different endings, okay? on the words coming in front of the nouns, okay? So declensions are inherent in the case system. You cannot use the case system unless you can appropriately use the clensions, unless you can appropriately slightly change the tail ends of the words coming in front of nouns and going into these different slots, going into these different cases. There are three elements that impact exactly how we use the case system, and I'm going to tell you more about them in the next video because you have to be able to make these slightly different changes yourself in in order to use the case system in German. So you need to know what the three elements are that impact how you change these words, okay? So if you haven't already started this series from the beginning, you can do that now, clicking off to the side or also off to the side, you can click on the very next video where we'll keep talking about the case system. But before you make either decision, make sure that you click below on the subscribe button so that you can know when I come out with new information and again, if if you haven't already done this below in the description, click on that link that will open up in a new tab so that you can register for free for my English Grammar for German Learners course where I go into more detail on these topics. All right, now I will see you in the next video.